Hi, my name is Dean Briley and I'm selling my Skywatcher 200p and HEQ5 mount on Facebook Marketplace and maybe eBay, but don't tell each other. People don't like that, I don't know why. Um, I'm getting a lot of the same questions over and over again, so just to try and address that and to show you a little bit more about what's going on with the scope and the modifications that I've made to it and uh, address this power supply as well, because I'm aware that it looks um, maybe a little bit janky, I suppose, but um, I promise you it's... it's um, it's store-bought products that are just joined together with some wires, um, all in a nice little package. So let me tell you about how it works at first. First, let's talk about the heart of the power supply. The heart of the power supply is a 12 volt, 20 amp CCTV power supply. Uh, you will not find a, a cheaper one. Uh, the only problem is they do have exposed terminals on, on this side, so it does have to be in some kind of enclosure. So that's what the, the plastic box is about. Also, it makes it a little bit more convenient to carry. Uh, everything is mains earth reference, so the exterior body is mounted to a plate, a metal plate in the bottom, and both of them are grounded together, and then everything is grounded to earth. So uh, electrically, on the main side of things, it's safe, and the cable is knotted, so it can't be pulled out. Um, next, I'll, I want to talk about these two little book converters on top. So the first one, these can be switched on and off independently if you don't want the current draw. Um, it's up to you. It's just a nice little feature that's included. So. You turn them on using this button, and this book converter is outputting 5 volts to these four USB ports. Uh, I believe, if memory serves, it's either 2 or 3 amps maximum throughput on the output side. Which, uh, to be honest, it is more than enough. It's absolutely more than enough for charging uh, a phone and running a couple of other USB items if you wanted to. Um, the top two ports, they're capable of charging Apple devices because the, the data lines are shorted together, so you don't get the... Um, uh, you know, does not work with Apple devices message. It, that, that They all work fine. Uh, the second book converter, this one's calibrated to output 7.4 volts uh, at the output, which it does really nicely. So I have a little Aneng power meter. You should get one of these, by the way. They're very good. Uh, auto arranging does the business. So we'll hit the negative side. And it's putting out 7.462 volts, which is absolutely perfect. So it's right, right within specification for it. It's a 1% it's class device. So happy with that one. And the other one is outputting a solid 5.1. Uh, the maximum for USB is 1.25. That would be in specification. So yeah, I'm happy with that. And it holds the voltage real stable as well. Uh, there's a couple of other features on these. So you can press the button and it shows you how much current draw is currently taking place through the book converter. And then the final setting shows the input voltage, which is 12.4. We'll come back to that in a minute, so knock these off again. Uh, the other features inside are, well, let's come to the front. The other feature, and one that I'm particularly proud of, <laughs> it's very useful actually, is that this button turns on LEDs that go down the legs of, um, down the, legs of the mount. It's individually fused to one amp, um, which is about right, to be honest. I think they draw about 700 milliamps static, so yeah, one amp is fine. But um, you know, you just undo the little door, drop a new glass fuse in it, and away you go. So this would be the connector for those LEDs. Um, they are on a PWM uh, pulse width modulated chip, so you can change the brightness using this because uh, at full brightness it is a little bit it is a little bit too intense to be honest. <clears throat> the other thing on the front is these five outputs. These all output 12.4 uh, volts for for all your gear, you know. The, the focuser, uh, the mount itself, so on and so forth. A anything that takes 12 volts that you normally use the little cigarette plugs for on your battery and that take uh, all of the Astro stuff seems to be this four millimeter plug. They're all these four millimeter plugs and you get 12.4 volts. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm back powering that, which is it's not right. Um, for your information, every single one of them is center positive. It's very, very uncommon to find something that's center negative but it does happen. Now, moving on to the next section, this is the three channel geoheater. Uh, the channels aren't individually controlled. They're controlled as one, uh, but this is a channel, then this is a channel, then this is a channel. <clears throat> oh, nice. Um, this fan inside the CCTV meter only comes on when the unit starts to get above 40 degrees. Um, so it just kicked in then, and then it knocks itself off again straight away because there's no load on it, so... It's very, uh, very unlikely to get much warmer than 40. Uh, the fan is a really nice addition, especially with it being automatic, because it stays quiet. Uh, going back to the dew heaters, these are also PWM controlled, and there's a little monitor for showing um, the percentage duty cycle. So now we're at 
on time, not off time. Um, the maximum current draw through the dew heater is three amps. So you do have to watch that. Just be careful with it. It is possible to push it beyond three amps, but they're all individually fused and they just use the little glass fuses that you can get from literally anywhere for a couple of pennies. Um, but yeah, all the way down to zero, which does actually go uh, flat zero off. Uh, going around to the, the back or the front, whichever way you want to call it, I've installed this really nice, really gimmicky, uh, made from pure Chineseium um, power monitor. It, it's quite accurate on the voltage, actually. Uh, everything I've tested it with, um, it, it's very good, especially at uh, the, the least significant digit. And the current is accurate as well. So right now it's drawing 80 milliamps uh, to power the book converter and the PWM and so on and so forth, and all the lights that's on it. Uh, it does have a total power monitor. Uh, the reason I got it really was for the for the current monitoring because uh, you, you, I've, I find it very difficult to get up to 10 amps. When I've been powering absolutely everything and the mount's been slowing, uh, I have seen it up to seven amps, uh, which, which causes the fan to spin. It's not a concern, I mean, it's rated to up to 20, but it's just nice to have so you can see how much energy you pull in at a particular time. And uh, I've drawn 8,000 watt hours through this unit, which is nice. It's never been reset. There's a little reset button here if you want to reset it when you get it. Right, uh, I think that pretty much covers everything for the power supply. Um, oh, no, one last thing. If for some reason um, the little four millimeter plugs are no good and your device doesn't fit into one of these, what I've got is I've got two bus bars at the back. So this is a positive rail and this is the negative rail on this side. And you just open these little, these little clips, you drop your wire in and you shut it on it. I found that because the lid's on a little rubber seal, you can generally just loop the wires over the back and just finger tight the screws and that keeps that keeps any dumb mistakes from happening and dropping a screwdriver in here or something like that. All right, well, I think that pretty much covers it for the power supply. Um, let's go and have a look at the mount. So I'm here at the mount now and I think the next most common question that I've been getting is um, the belt modification, like where is it and what does it do? And well, I'll just take this little panel off and I'll show you. So the, the belt mod was hidden behind those little uh, six screws little panel just lifts off it and in, inside here there's this is the belt modification now so this is the uh, azimuth and this is the altitude and a concern that a lot of people had was does the belt come off and I'll tell you what I, I put that belt modification on uh, I don't know 18 months ago I closed the little panel up and this is the first time I'm seeing it now so I've had very very little problem with it well I say very little I mean no problem I've had no problem at all with it I've just powered on the mount and normally underneath here there's um, a little set of brass gears and when you're slewing the brass gears they um, they ring together and they make a little tune and it makes the the mount slewing sound really um, low quality. So I've just moved the microphone a little bit closer and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a little sample of how it sounds with the belt modification. and both motors together. So now it's direct drive from the stepper motor all the way through the gear train to the worm gear. So the only bit of backlash now is contained in the worm gear and it's really solid. This is a really nice upgrade. Uh, people are asking me if I made it myself. No, I didn't. I um, I ordered it from a company in Germany. Uh, you can search online for it and you can see how much it was. And I'll tell you, it's eye-wateringly expensive. But simple. I'm not sure if you're familiar with these kind of mounts already, but this little power light, it's actually power monitoring as well. So typically these mounts are powered through batteries. But what that means for this mount is that when it's powered through the power supply that I've just shown you, uh, through mains power and um, because it's set to 12 volts it can drop below 11.8 volts which is the threshold voltage and what happens is it causes this little light to blink which means that the battery is getting low but that isn't the case because it's running on mains uh, the reason for me choosing 12 volts is that everything else in the power supply plays so nice at 12 volts but a fully charged battery uh, when you're using the battery version 
uh, they actually output 14.4 volts so that's the maximum input voltage so the nominal voltage is 12 but the maximum input voltage is actually 15 uh, the minimum is 11.8 so when it's slewing just from time to time it's very rare but every now and again it causes that little light to blink which maybe suggests that it's running out of power but it absolutely isn't that power supply is more than capable of providing the power it needs right now I'm just using the hand controller to power the mount around So next I wanted to talk about this ADM dovetail plate that I've, uh, there's an upgrade for it. Uh, it's made of aluminium, it's got these really nice screws and the screws are Delrin Bush so when it's cold outside they don't get stuck. Uh, the original one that was on there, it had uh, two screws that were drove into the side of the dovetail plate on the telescope and it used to really like mar up the dovetails and it would just be like, like two points of contact so it was actually quite easy to, uh, to skew the telescope inside the mount. So you spend ages leveling the mount and then you put the telescope in it and do the screws up and the telescope would be slightly wonky. Um, at astronomical distances, just a couple of millimetres is enough to ruin your evening. So uh, this ADM plate actually takes both sides of dovetail plates. Uh, my one fits inside the smaller one. But because the whole rail backs out, even if you only tighten one of the screws, it's spring-loaded as well so it comes out nice and even. Even if you only tighten one of the screws, you, you'd get a relatively even amount of pressure which reduces, I think they call it plate solving error. Um, don't quote me on that one. But it just removes that little problem and it's a, it's a more positive engagement system so it gives you that extra bit of security that your telescope isn't going to fall out when you start slewing. Never happened to me, but I have seen it happen. This is the inside of the telescope. It's kind of hard to show you actually because um, the whole, all the way down the full barrel has been professionally flocked. Um, if you don't know what flocking is, basically they coat the inside of it with like a felt material and it just stops the light from bouncing around in there when, um, when you're taking photographs and you get a really, really good contrast out of it. To show you down inside there, the camera actually has real trouble being able to pick it up because it's so incredibly black. Um, but yeah, just trust me, if you put your hand inside there, it feels like, um, feels like felt. The screws in the secondary mirror support, you can see they're not all wallowed out, they're all in good condition. On the primary mirror, eh, it'd be very hard to make out, but... It's, it's relatively free of dust, it's never been cleaned, it's never been scrubbed, there's no scratches on it. It's definitely never been out of its cell. Um, the only time that I've ever made adjustments to it is when, um, when I've used a laser collimator, which is also included in this cell. So right now I've got my Canon camera mounted up to the scope and, and everything's all locked off. And I just wanted to show you the level of contrast that's possible. If you've ever taken a photograph in the day through a telescope, you'll know that normally it's quite washed out and um, you know there's a lot of mid-tones in there. Um, but just so, just to show the, the validity of this test, I'm actually shooting from the living room to across the street to my neighbor's uh, front wall. So I'm actually shooting through a pane of glass as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to very carefully try and push this button without introducing any wobble. Uh, it's on a two second timer as well. And then the photo that's taken you should be looking at now. I'll also show you the distance that the telescope is shooting this over. So just by way of example, I wanted to show you what it was that I was shooting and, and the contrast that's possible through an actual video camera rather than, uh, than an astral telescope. So the idea that I was aiming for is, is across the street and it's the right hand corner of this window ledge just next to the satellite dish. So now you can see the comparison between an actual video camera that's designed for this sort of thing and, and a telescope that um, has the ability to produce about the same amount of contrast. All right, on to the next. So the next thing I wanted to talk to you about, guys, was the uh, the eyepiece holder. Uh, normally the, you put eyepieces in this, but I don't. I, I normally mount a camera onto here. And this, this telescope was used from the living room remotely via Wi-Fi. And I would sit in the armchair and I would do some armchair astronomy, which was really nice. So it comes with this um, uh, DC focus controller from High Tech Astro. It's powered from the power supply, 12 volts again. And it's also possible to uh, connect it to your PC and use USB control, which is why I was doing it. Um, but for your purposes, it has a nice in and out button. Now, I know that it looks like the focus is incredibly slow, but what you normally do is you get it pretty close by hand and then use the buttons to uh, finesse the focus right at the end. This unit remains permanently mounted to the device, but it's not a problem. You can actually turn the, uh, the hand wheel on the other side 
with minimal issues, uh, as long as you're careful, because you are back driving the motor, it's a, a single shaft. It's recommended that you don't do that, but yeah, I haven't had any issues with it. Just turn it slowly. Just remember, a, a big jump in focus makes the scope shake anyway, and it blows your star and you can't see what you're doing. So yeah, I, I've really enjoyed using this little focus thing. I, I know it looks so slow, but it's actually really nice. You get that ultra fine control, and every time you're using the buttons, uh, the scope isn't jiggling, so you can get that really, really accurate focus with it. So next, I thought we could talk about the spotter scope that's mounted up on top. A lot of people aren't sure what, what this uh, second scope's for. You're like, why do I need two scopes? Because it was primarily used for astrophotography. Honestly, I haven't actually ever seen a single piece of light that comes through this, because on the back side, there's a, a little color camera mounted. So what this color camera does is it, it's specifically designed for this purpose. Let me bring you in a little bit closer. So this camera on the back is made by QHY CCD and it's a QHY 5P2 color. Uh, really it's better as a mono camera, mono cameras are more sensitive, but uh, at the time I was ordering it they only had color in stock and it was on for three days delivery rather than 27. So I went for the color version. Uh, there's a few extra little steppy mounts in here, so this one and this one. Uh, that's because the camera requires, or rather this telescope, uses an incredible amount of back focus because normally there's a, a 90 degree eyepiece mount on this and, and that increases the back focus distance. So that's why all this little assembly is on here. But um, no automatic focus on this one, but it's real simple. Just the manual focus as you go. Uh, this camera is specially designed for astrophotography. And down this cable, this cable isn't a power cable, this is a pulse cable. So if you're not familiar with what these cameras actually do, um, they're powered through USB, which goes to the computer. And there's an application on the computer that, that just watches a star. Uh, as the mount is tracking, if the star starts to move, this cable on the underside of the camera tells the mount how far the star has moved and in which direction. And it sends a little pulse down there to tell the mount to catch up. So it means that very, very long exposure photography is possible. So this mount is already specifically designed to be controlled by a camera and there's an auto guider port already on it. You just connect the two together and install the software. Easy peasy. So this is the last thing that I want to talk to you about. This is the hand controller that came with it. Um, this is this is what gives you this is what gives you all of the go-to functions. So it turns on with the mount, connects through the supplied cable. You get a little initializing, and then as soon as this initializing message goes away, and you can hear the um, the hum from the holding torque on the stepper motors, you can just start slowing the mount straight away. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you can. Uh, when you're ready, you push enter and it says warning, uh, never use your telescope to look at the sun. If you need to be told that, don't buy this telescope. You just enter into it. So you set your longitude and your latitude, both of those things you can get from your phone, go on the compass and it'll tell you. Um, time zone, uh, I'm in GMT, hopefully the same as you because delivery is going to be a nightmare otherwise. Uh, elevation, I'm at 40 meters above sea level. Again, you can get this information from your phone. It's fairly accurate. If not, use Google. Uh, the date, today's date's the, uh, the 9th of October, 2019. So you set the date. Uh, the time is not 8 o'clock. The time is 13.42 in the afternoon. Uh, seconds is important for the mounts tracking, but in this case, I'm not really going to bother with it. So yeah, it's 1.42 p.m. Uh, are we in daylight savings? Uh, currently, yes. Uh, this year's daylight savings ends on the 27th of October. So currently, we are in daylight savings. And this tells you the hour angle of where Polaris is going to appear in the polar scope. So this information, normally I get this information from an app on my phone because I, I don't use the, the handset. But it's really, really nice to have. So um, in Ascension, that's where it should appear. So when you're using the polar scope to get your polar alignment, the, the, um, the hand control is really useful for that. Uh, polar alignment using the polar scope gets you close. It's not great for astrophotography. So for that one, I would recommend using the tracking software that I've shown you earlier. Uh, begin alignment. So what this does is it'll, um, it chooses a few stars that, that you should be able to see, or rather you choose a star that you can see and uh, the mount will move to it. And then it asks you, is that in the middle? And you go like 99% of the time you say, no, <laughs> no, it isn't. And um, you'll move using these buttons and it'll do a two or a three star alignment and that basically helps the mount re-triangulate its position and how far off your polar alignment error is. I'm just going to choose no because right now it's in the living room, it's the middle of the day. 
<clears throat> so now you can go on a, a tour and you can choose, sorry, the arrows that you use to move the menus are these two here. It's kind of counterintuitive to use these ones, but these are the buttons that you need to be using to move the menus. So, you know, it's got all the libraries in it. It's got the, the M library, the NGC and the IC, planets, objects, and then user defined objects, which you can set in and it saves. I'm not going to do a full tutorial on how to use the hand controller, primarily because I actually don't know 100%. Like I'm not very familiar with it. I've seen them being used, but 99.5% of the time, I used uh, the PC to control it and either um, Stellarium or Carte de Seal for moving the mount, star positions, what I wanted to track, and I used a PhD2 for the alignment. Uh, there's tons of tutorials online on how to do that. Um, but yeah, so yeah, thanks for watching. And just remember, if you think that you don't need a second telescope, you always need a second telescope. And if it's the wife, just remember, forgiveness is easier than permission.